And so I invite you to open your Bibles to Psalm 4 as we move into the sermon. The, uh, we'll read us some scripture to, as I said this morning, my practice is to have a little uh, connection between the Testaments by uh, reading a pa- parallel passage in the, opo- the opposite uh, Testament. So here our text is in Psalm 4, but we'll also look at 1 Peter 1 where we have some parallel thoughts fleshed out in the New Testament. So first then, Psalm 4. Our text is the entire psalm. To the chief musician with stringed instruments, a psalm of David, hear me when I call, O God of my righteousness. You have relieved me in my distress. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. How long, O you sons of men, will you turn my glory to shame? How long will you love worthlessness and seek falsehood? Selah. But know that the Lord has set apart for himself him who is godly. The Lord will hear when I call to him. Be angry and do not sin. Meditate within your heart on your bed and be still. Silah. Offer the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. There are many who say, Who will show us any good? Lord, lift up the light of your countenance upon us. You have put you have put gladness in my heart, more than in the season that their grain and wine increased. I will both lie down in peace and sleep, for you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. You might keep a marker there in Psalm 4. We'll come right back. But we'll turn now to 1 Peter 1. It's a short reading there, verses 3 through 9, where we will find similar thoughts as are expressed in Psalm 4. 1 Peter 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy, has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though for now, though now for a little while, if need be, You have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom, having not seen you love, though now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Now turn back with me please back to Psalm 4. Congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, perhaps it goes without saying and it's stating the obvious to say that 2016 had its distressing times and 2017 no doubt will have its distressing times. The w- We have just been through a presidential election unlike any other that the pundits tell us where it was evident that there are two very different versions or visions of America or for America amongst the populace of our country. And besides that, battles rage on and there are troubling things in our culture like abortion and the redefining of marriage, terrorists who want to kill American Christians here and abroad, economic troubles such as our $19 trillion in debt and trillions of dollars in our deficit and 23 million Americans out of work. There are tens of millions of non-Christians who will undoubtedly in 2017 again try to shame 
conservative Protestant Christians like us, which is such, so foreign to baby boomers like myself and some of you who experienced during from the 1950s to the 1970s the, a place in America where conservative Protestant Christians were welcomed and honored, more or less but have seen now in these last 10 years tens of millions of non-Christians who love to see conservative Protestant Christians mocked. Enemies of Christ's church call us intolerant bigots and hateful and self-righteous hypocrites. The media says that we are dangerous. Some saying we are even more dangerous than fundamentalist Muslims. Undoubtedly, all this to say that undoubtedly the next 12 months will come with distressing times. So then can we be confident even in such distressing times? Confident in the power and the grace of our God. We heard this morning that our God is at work and will continue to be at work working in us, working out His grace in us throughout the coming year. King David here experienced his own distressing times. We remember, for example, the distressing times he had while Saul pursued him, the distressing times he had thousands of years ago when his own son thrust him out of his kingdom. But our triune God inspired him to write this psalm to demonstrate our confidence in God through Christ. Perhaps you have a sermon outline, I hope, that shows you how we'll see this in three ways in the unfolding of the psalm. In 2017, as always, we can have confidence in God through Christ. First, confidence to call on Him when we are distressed. Second, confidence to caution those non-Christians we mention. And third, confidence to count God's blessings again this coming year. Let's look at those one at a time. In 2017, again, we can have, and we should have, confidence in God through Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. First of all, confidence to call upon Him when distressed. I mentioned some distressing things. We can be confident because in Christ, first of all, the text tells us in verse 1, that God has become the God of our righteousness. Hear me when I call, he says, O God of my righteousness. From the very beginning, we are reminded that our security is in Yahweh, the triune God, the God of our righteousness. As you know, the Lord has many titles in both Testaments. This is one of them. And it speaks volumes in terms of how that is fleshed out in the New Testament, especially. This is a prayer for confidence in the triune God in distressing times. And confidence because of who you are in Christ. Not because of who you are in yourselves, but because of who you are in Him as you face distressing times. This language points us to the Lord, our righteousness. The Lord Jesus Christ. In Jeremiah 23, 6, perhaps you've memorized this verse. In His days Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell safely. Now this is His name by which he be, will be called the Lord, Yahweh, our righteousness. And now as we, come, as we think about how this name and title of our Lord is fleshed out in the New Testament, we remember that Paul writes in Romans the, that to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace but as debt, but to him who does not work but believes on him whom justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted. For righteousness. Or in another epistle in 2 Corinthians, he writes, For he made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might be the righteousness of God in him. That's where our confidence lies in God, our righteousness. Not in ours, but in his. And as our righteousness, he relieves his beloved people in our distress. So says the psalmist in verse 1. You have relieved me in my distress. When the time comes this year, as I'm sure it will for almost every one of us, 
when perhaps false accusations and name calling comes from the enemies of Christ, take refuge in this. You, beloved brothers and sisters, are counted as righteous in the sight of the judge of all the earth. We looked at the, the Westminster Catechisms this morning. Allow me to quote from our catechism, the Heidelberg Catechism, on this point. Although my conscience accuses me that I have grievously sinned against all the commandments of God and never kept any of them, and I'm still prone always to all evil, yet God, without any merit of mine, of mere grace, grants and imputes to me the perfect satisfaction, righteousness, and holiness of Christ, as if I had never committed nor had any sins, and had myself accomplished all the obedience which Christ has fulfilled for me. In Christ, God is the God of our righteousness. And he goes on. He cries out, have mercy on me and hear my prayer. You can hear the distress in David's voice and mind as he writes. In Christ, we too, as disciples of Christ, call on our God for mercy in distressing times. And in Christ, the Father shows us mercy. The, uh, Jeremiah writes, Your mercies are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness, O God our Father. In Exodus, as the Lord gives the law, even amidst the trembling of the people, He says of Himself, that he shows mercy to thousands of those who love him and keep his commandments. And so our situation is similar to David's. By grace, we know that our only hope for mercy in distressing times comes from Yahweh, the triune God, because of his Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Throughout this psalm, you'll notice already, David is honest about his situation. This is a psalm of lament, but it's not just a lament. As many of the psalm of laments, it also exudes confidence in Yahweh. Throughout the psalm, he's honest about his situation. As in many of his psalms of lament, he does not feel any need for pretense to pretend to keep a stiff upper lip like a stoic. And as we begin to embark in our study of this psalm and our consideration of the psalm, your Heavenly Father wants you and I also to honestly come to Him in our prayers, in our laments, and pour out our hearts to Him like the psalmist. He knows how you really feel anyway. We might as well be honest with Him. We're not fooling Him if we try to keep a stiff upper lip when our hearts are breaking. In, to illustrate the point, we can maybe argue from the lesser to the greater. Those of you who are earthly fathers know, and of course mothers too, know how it is to want to hear your child pour out your heart, pour out her heart to you, knowing how she feels anyway. And if that is true of us, how much more of our compassionate God. And so... As we move into a new year, may your Father give you confidence to call upon Him when you are distressed in 2017. And you will find, brothers and sisters, just as the psalmist does, and we'll see in a moment as we move toward the end of the psalm, the difference in His tone at the beginning and the end. The more you call on God as the psalmist did in distressing times, the more you will find contentment and peace in Christ. God is our God of right, the God of our righteousness. He is the God of all mercy. We've been to the table of the Lord, and we reminded now again that because of our communion and communion with Christ, we can have confidence with God, in God through Christ. Confidence to call on Him when distressed. That's the first thing. Secondly, we can have confidence to caution non-Christians. And that may sound strange to you, but that's exactly what the psalmist does in this psalm. He takes on his hecklers, if you will. Confidence to caution non-Christians in Christ's name. First of all, 
challenging their tactics. I want to read verse 2 for you, with, and I'm using the New King James Version. I'm going to read it without the italics to give you a sense of how it sounds in, in the Hebrew. How long, O you sons of men, my glory to shame? Will you love worthlessness, seek falsehood? Selah. The enemies of Christ Jesus, make no mistake about it, want to injure the personal and official dignity of Christ's servant leaders by any means possible. What are their tactics? The psalmist lays out three here. They turn the glory of the Christian to shame, or at least they try to. They love vanity or worthlessness, and they seek falsehood. When we see these not only in David, a type of Christ, but we see them in the experience of our Lord Jesus Christ himself, don't we? As we think about his life for those 33 years on this planet as the God-man, we remember that his own people tried to turn his glory into shame, so much so that they apparently hung him naked on the cross. They loved worthlessness. Jesus said of them, in vain, you worship me. They sought falsehoods. Remember the false accusations they laid against him. He said that he would destroy this magnificent temple and then raise it up again in three days, they said. They, loved, they sought falsehoods to, they thought, bring him down to nothing. And yet, he triumphed over them, didn't he? And so, in Christ... So it is with us. If it has been so with our Savior, how much more for His, or our Lord, how much more for us, His disciples, His followers. The next thing that the psalmist sets before us is that in, in terms of this cautioning non-Christians is that in Christ we are to remember and even to remind non-Christians that without pride, without any sense of pride, in humility, that in Christ, the Father has set us apart for Himself to become godly. Verse 3, know that the Lord has set apart for Himself Him who is godly. God the Father, Jehovah, sets the faithful ones apart to Himself. The New King James reads, Him who is godly, that all those words are one Hebrew word. You may have heard the word chesed, the Hebrew word that means covenant faithfulness or loving kindness sometimes in the old King James. This is, the, this is a related word, chesed, and it means covenant faithfulness. It means the one who is faithful to Yahweh's covenant of grace. And that again takes our minds to the idea of justification. The, how is it that we are counted, we sinners, can possibly be counted as those who are godly, or to use the language of the Hebrew here, those who are faithful to His covenant of grace? How can that possibly be? It is because of the imputed righteousness of Christ. As we read from the Heidelberg Catechism, as, as counted as righteous because His righteousness is laid to our account. As if we had never committed or had any sin, as if we ourselves had fulfilled all the commandments of the Lord in our own person. Because of our substitute, because His act of obedience and His passive obedience on the cross is counted as ours, laid to our account. The Lord has set us apart by His grace. As if David had said, and as if we were to say, Who are you, my enemy, to try to attempt to turn my glory into shame? You would take on God Himself if you would try to heap shame upon me. I am counted as righteous in God's sight not because of my own righteousness, but because of what He has done for Him. Yahweh counts us as His own. He counts us as the faithful ones because He looks at us through His Son. And so, the Westminster Confession of Faith gets at this in chapter 18. 
in section 11, where it pits or contrasts for us this very thing, the hypocrites, the ungodly on one side and the righteous on the other. Although hypocrites and other unregenerate men may vainly deceive themselves with false hopes and carnal presumptions of being in the favor of God and, and a state of salvation which hope of theirs shall perish, yet such as truly believe in the Lord Jesus and love Him in sincerity, endeavoring to walk in all good conscience before Him, may in this life be certainly assured that they are in the state of grace and may rejoice in the hope of the glory of God, which hope shall never make them ashamed. On Christians will undoubtedly seek to try to make us ashamed of our Christianity in 2017. But Yahweh has set us apart for himself, him who is godly. And that is what matters at the end most and at the end of the day. And therefore, since all of this is true, we should, we should caution non-Christians the way that David did. Since God has set us apart for himself by his grace, no matter what you say or think, my enemy, the Lord will hear us when we call to him. In 2017, we can have confidence in Christ as our great high priest that as always, again this year, he will hear and he will defend his church from its attackers. In Christ, again in 2017, let us call on our Father to vindicate us, not for our sakes, but for His glory. Let us call on the Father, not friends, not family, not using tactics of getting even. Notice what happens in David's experience. The psalm begins with anxiety and distress. And now at this transitional point, He's beginning to move toward a calm spirit. It ends with a calm spirit and a peaceful, serene trust in God in distressing times. Distressing times didn't necessarily go away, but David's attitude about them changes as we move through the psalm. And so in Christ, we like him caution non-Christians like this, be angry and do not sin, or perhaps better, literally translated, tremble and do not sin. That is to say to the non-Christians, forsake your blind passion as you lash out against Christ by lashing out against His people. There's lots of that blind passion in California against Christ and His people, isn't there? And the flip side of it is, don't do that, but rather meditate within your heart on your bed and be still. Think about that, Selah. In Christ, we like David can caution non-Christians in 2017 like this. Do not content yourselves with formalism. Verse 5, offer the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord in Yahweh. Writing on this portion, Calvin writes, John Calvin, it is as if David said, you think that God is on your side because you sacrifice in the temple and I am banished. But your sacrifices must come from a faithful heart to be acceptable. And so brothers and sisters, may you find contentment in distressing times of 2017 by putting your trust in our triune God anew and afresh and again and again. In 2017, offer the sacrifices of righteousness and be not content with any formalism. Put your trust in the Lord. It's true, the enemies of Christ may be allowed to win a few battles in 2017, but they will not win the war. In 2017, trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you can be confident that His church with His people scattered all over the globe will triumph over her hecklers and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That's the second thing. Confidence in God through Christ gives us confidence to caution non-Christians. 
not by our own strength or with our own words, but in his and with his words. And that brings us to the third thing. Confidence in God through Christ gives us confidence to count God's blessings. You see the turning of the corner of the psalm now. There's still a little bit of lament here, but the tone is beginning to change now in David's heart and mind. He reminds us that not only is God the God of our righteousness, but in Christ, God has this poetic language of lifting up the light of his countenance upon us. There are many, verse 6, who say, who will show us any good? And this answers the question for us as Christians in the 21st century. What should you and I do when experiencing injustice at the hands of non-Christians? This is a final expression of the psalmist's security in God. His future certainly looked bleak, both in the days of Saul and in the days of Absalom, when he found himself a fugitive. His troops were demoralized. And he came to the realization that there is no prosperity, there is no good. No one will show us any good without Christ, without Messiah. The good life is found in our only comfort in life and in death, that we belong to our faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. Non-Christians content themselves what they call the good life, and they define it by various ways. But it always leaves God, leaves Christ out of the picture. And so they need rebuke by the Word and Spirit to trust in God. And therefore, in Christ, our concept of the good life is very different from that of the hecklers. They say, who's going to show you poor Christians any good? You're a miserable lot. You're the deplorables, to use the language of some. But the answer, the response of faith in the, from the psalmist is, Lord, lift up the light of your countenance upon us. Happiness in distress lies in God's favor, in his smiling face, in his love to us because of Christ. Lord, lift up the countenance, your countenance upon us again in 2017. You rem- those la- that language hearkens to the, back to the benediction of numbers, doesn't it, that you're so familiar with you. Bless the children of, this, of Israel this way. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord lift up his face. Let the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Calvin again, quote, Our happiness in trials lies in God's smiling fatherly face, unquote. We think of our, our own smiling faces dads and when our children were little especially but even as they move into adulthood the smiling face of a father still has a wonderful effect on our children so much so so much more if that is the case with us the least and how much more with our father's smiling face in Christ the father has put gladness in our hearts the psalmist tells us And that reminds us of what we read in 1 Peter 1. We are kept by the power of God through faith. We greatly rejoice in this, though certainly for a while it might be needful for us to be grieved by various trials. Though now that we might be found to praise and honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And therefore, brothers and sisters in Christ, our blessings are so much more abundant than the riches of our hecklers. In fact, there's no comparison. The psalmist uses agricultural language to get at it because he lived in that milieu, that environment. Verse 7, you have put gladness in my heart more than in the season that their grain and wine increased. Yes, brothers and sisters, the present is distressing on one level. But you, by God's grace, are at peace with God in Christ. And because of Christ, He smiles. He lifts up the light of His countenance on you. Maybe you have been 
in the last few years, cut off from the abundance of corn and wine, so to speak. But you, beloved, know far greater treasures than those, far greater treasures than the non-Christian has in many storehouses, in many bank accounts. You have more joy in communion with Christ and his church than whatever may come their way. Record yields, yet record sales, million dollar IRAs, or whatever it might be. The ungodly, no matter how much they gain to themselves, are never satisfied. But for us in Christ, as James Montgomery Boyce writes, joy floods our hearts when we are conscious of the Lord's favor. In Christ alone, we, like the psalmist, dwell in safety. And therefore, because of our safety in Christ, that safety can let us sleep like babies in the middle of distress. Verse 8, I will both lie down in peace and sleep, for you alone, Lord, make me dwell in safety. When our soul confidence is in our triune God, not in ourselves, not in the military prowess of the United States of America, not in mighty men, not in we the people, but when our soul confidence is in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, then it is that the Lord can give us a good night's sleep, even while hitmen are looking for us. And that was David's situation. Security in God allows us to be truly carefree. We think about some of the missionaries, perhaps you know some of them personally, who, though perhaps isolated and in very dangerous situations, need no guards because the Lord watches over them and spoils the plans of those who would destroy them. Voice again, if we leave our problems with God, He will shoulder them and He will enable us to sleep in peace. And so, beloved, may you find contentment in the distressing times of 2017 that lie ahead by counting your blessings the way the psalmist did, by counting the blessings of 2016 and, and perhaps decades of gone before. May the Lord help you to find contentment in the distressing times coming by reflecting on this biblical concept of what the good life really is. May the Lord help you to find contentment in these distressing times by reminding you often that your blessings in Christ are more abundant than those of the wealthiest Americans. May your confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ alone help you to find contentment in distressing times so, so much so that you can sleep like a baby in the midst of distressing times. Does not that inward peace that we have in Christ surpass all the blessings, the physical blessings that we can conceive of? When sleep departs from you in 2017, I'm sure it will from time to time, and for me too, count your blessings the way that David does here in the Psalms, that you may find, as he did, that you can sleep as though you had an angelic army surrounding you, though there is no apparent help from any source. You'll find a quote, I think, on the back of your bulletin about, from James Boyce that we'll use to conclude. As Craigie says, at the end, the psalmist has seen that he is better off than his adversaries. He has advised them to lie still on their beds in an attempt to curtail their evil. But he could lie in his bed and sleep the sleep of peace which came from God. It is always that way. If we leave our problems with God, he will shoulder them and he will enable us to sleep in peace. Or to quote a song that we perhaps you have sung, When upon life's billows you are tempest-tossed, when you are discouraged, thinking all is lost, count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. May God give you confidence in him through Christ. Confidence 
to call on him when distressed in the months ahead. Confidence to even caution non-Christians in his name. Confidence, confidence to count God's blessings in distressing times. Amen. We stand now and sing as a hymn of application, A Mighty Fortress is Our God.